When you think of the deadliest living beings on Earth, your mind might first turn to some of the animals with a chance to threaten the life of a human, such as a lion or maybe a polar bear. They simply don't have a comparatively high death toll, however. Next, you might think of the ant. With trillions of members across the globe constantly fighting for territory, surely they have the most skeletons in their closet. Truthfully, to find the deadliest living being on Earth, we must look much, much smaller. This is the bacteriophage, and while it looks like a futuristic bioweapon, it is actually part of a naturally occurring family of double-stranded DNA viruses known as Duplo-Naviria, a portmanteau of the Latin word for double, Duplo, the acronym DNA, and Viria, the suffix used for virus realms. While not harmful to all but select species of bacteria, scientists believe that every second of every day these bacteriophages mediate gene transfer with bacteria 20 million billion times. This means an insane, uncountable number of deaths by transduction across history, especially given the fact that phages are one of the world's oldest nucleotide-based organisms, likely evolving around 3 billion years ago. With their incredible natural ability to target specific bacteria, modern medicine is turning to phages to solve the pressing issue of antibiotic resistance. They are the scalpel to the antibiotic carpet bomb, able to pass through your body without harming your native cells or gut microbiome while ruthlessly eliminating their target. Welcome to the incredibly fascinating world of the bacteriophage. In 1896, an English biologist Ernst Hankin was studying cholera and malaria along the banks of the Ganges and the Yamuna rivers. Challenging the prevalent theory that a miasma was causing the diseases, he demonstrated that microorganisms were responsible and showed that boiling collected water was effective to stop the spread of the diseases. In Hankin's notes, however, he noted that the water of the river had a marked antibiotic effect, which was lost after the water was boiled. This is one of the oldest descriptions of a phage-like organism, but it wouldn't be for another 19 years until phages were explicitly described. Independently, over the span of two years, Friedrich Twort, a bacteriologist from the Brown Institute in London, and Félix de Harel, a French-Canadian working at the Pasteur Institute in Paris, both described phages directly. Twart was attempting to grow Staphylococcus, a smallpox bacteria, on an agar plate when he noted that under a magnifying glass, there were little clear spots on the dish that would not grow when subcultured. He noted that he was able to take a sample from one dead area and use it to kill off other colonies of the bacteria. Further observations revealed that this agent could pass through a porcelain filter and it required the bacteria to grow. Ward had discovered all of the features of what we now know to be the bacteriophage, but he theorized that his observations were not due to a different organism, but instead to a bacteriolytic enzyme, as he described it in his paper in The Lancet in 1915. Sadly, Twart's work was cut short due to the onset of World War I. Two years later, de Harel discovered an invisible antagonistic microbe of the dysentery bacillus, which he noted was able to pass through porcelain filters. De Harel took the research a step further, isolating phages from chicken feces by the porcelain method, which would strip the sample of all things larger than the phages. He successfully used a strain of isolated phages to cure a chicken of typhus. Soon after that, he performed the first instance of phage therapy on a human, curing a man of dysentery in 1919, with many more to follow. It was at this time that renowned scientists began debating on the true nature of the bacteriolytic agent, with de Harel claiming that it was a biological organism that somehow fed and reproduced around specific bacteria. Others, like the noblest Jules Bourdais, and indeed Twart two years earlier, thought the phages were inanimate enzymes released by the bacteria themselves. Due to this uncertainty and de Harel's lack of hesitation to perform trials on humans, de Harel faced animosity from the greater scientific community, although he would win the prestigious Leeuwenhoek medal, which was important to him as it was the same medal that Louis Pasteur had won in 1895. Over the following years, phage therapy gained traction, and various phage strains would be identified and used to cure their respective diseases, especially in the Soviet state of Georgia. It would not be until 1939 that the true nature of the phage, a bacterium hunting virus, was discovered by Helmut Ruska with an early electron microscope. Phage therapy would lose popularity in the West due to the invention of popular antibiotics, as well as simply a language barrier between the research carried out in the Soviet Union 
and due to the fact that after de Harel, there was simply wasn't much effort put into determining the nature of phages and their applications outside of Georgia. It would not be until 2009 that the first regulated double-blind study of bacteriophages would be conducted and published in the Journal of Wound Care. The FDA would designate this a Phase 1 clinical trial, and while it showed the safety of phages, it failed to demonstrate their efficacy due to the use of chemicals normal to wound care, such as lactoferrin, in the study. Soon after this study was published, another paper showed the viability of treatment of ear infections caused by Pseudomonas aeruginosa by phage therapy. Counter to these promising studies, a third paper showed that not all phages are beneficial. Phages of the variety Inoviridae were shown to shelter and promote infection from the bacteria that cause pneumonia and cystic fibrosis. One case that drew attention to phages as a solution to the problem of antibiotic resistance arose in 2017. A man with a pancreas infected by the multi-drug resistant bacteria A. Baumani was given a cocktail of antibiotics to no effect. The patient was then voluntarily exposed to a cocktail of nine phage strains shown to be effective against A. Baumani. With this treatment, the patient's deteriorating condition quickly reversed and he made a re full return to health. Today, phage research is still in its infancy, especially outside of Georgia. With an increasing number of successful trials, however, it is expected that the targeted phage treatments will be available for general use within this decade. Progress has been slow due to a lack of funding and availability of good manufacturing practice phages for use in trials. These roadblocks are being removed, however, as governmental agencies such as the FDA, responding to a growing antibiotic resistance crisis, increase their funding of phage research. In order to better understand what makes phages such an effective and specific treatment, let us look closely at the morphology of the bacteriophage. Unfortunately, there is no evidence of the bacteriophage in the fossil record due to it not being able to fossilize at all, but their incredible genetic diversity suggests early evolutionary origins. The National Center for Biotechnic Information, NCBI, maintains a database of sequenced bacteriophage genomes currently standing at around 2,000 fully sequenced specimens spanning 70 bacterial hosts. This incredible genetic diversity leads to huge variation in morphology. Phages will vary in capsid height and diameter, as well as tail length and diameter. An archetypical example of the bacteriophage, however, is the T4 phage, which infects E. coli. The T4 phage consists of five components. First the head, a 20-faced icosahedral capsid made of around 2,000 protein capsomers, self-assembling proteins that construct the capsid containing the genetic information of the virus. Then the collar, and whiskers that control extension and retraction of the tail in differing environmental conditions. Connected to the collar is the tail, which consists of an inner tubular core surrounded by a contractile protein sheath. At the distal end of the phage connected to the tail is a base plate connected to six spikes at each corner, each about 130 nanometers long. The spikes are made of a proximal and a distal fiber, and the latter assisting with the recognition of receptor sites on the targeted cell. All of this viral machinery surrounds a single double-stranded DNA molecule about 50 micrometers long, wound tightly inside the capsid. Interestingly, the DNA is not only circular, but it also does not contain normal cytosine, like in our cells, but instead a methylated version known as 5-hydroxymethylcytosine. The exact functional reason for this is unknown, but leading theories are that it both protects the vegetative DNA from phage-controlled nucleases during synthesis, as well as speeding up the formation of tail fibers. According to this recent study, it is possible the synthesis of tail fibers can only happen with the methylated version of cytosine. Now that we know more about the morphology of the T4 phage, let's examine the reproductive cycle that makes it so useful to us medically. Phages can either reproduce with a lytic cycle, meaning construction of offspring within a host cell before bursting the cell wall, or a lysogenic cycle, which is much more complex and slower, involving a symbiosis between the virus and the host as the virus integrates its genetic information into that of the host cell. Interesting to note is that 10% of our DNA is viral, and was probably introduced to us through this lysogenic process. Both cycles, however, involve the phage recognizing the target cell through the receptors on its tail fibers before enzymes dissolve a portion of the cell wall, allowing the injection of the genetic information into the cytoplasm. It isn't fully understood what determines whether a virus will enter the lysogenic or the lytic cycle. Scientists have noted that the number of co-infecting phages has an effect, 
with larger numbers of simultaneous infections leading to the lysogenic cycle. In the lysogenic cycle, the, each phage's DNA is integrated into that of the host by phage-controlled proteins. Once integrated, the phage is now known as a prophage. One prophage gene keeps the rest of the genes silent. Each time the bacterial cell reproduces, it unknowingly copies the phage genes into its daughter cells. In this way, a single infected cell can give rise to a huge population of bacterial carrier cells. When they receive an environmental signal, such as a chemical or high-energy radiation, this will trigger the lytic cycle. Whether triggered by the lysogenic cycle or initiated out of the gate, in the lytic cycle, the phage genes hijack the ribosomes and other cellular machinery to produce viral components. When construction is complete, the phages release hollins, small proteins which form pores in the cellular membrane, allowing hydrolytic lysins to reach the peptoglycan, a polysaccharide that forms the mesh-like layer outside the plasma membrane. This destroys the integrity of the cell wall, releasing the newly constructed phages to start the cycle again. In the biomedical field, the ability to transfer genetic information into a specific cell is incredibly useful. Phages are the perfect delivery mechanism for all sorts of targeted gene therapies, but it isn't as simple as putting a gene you want to deliver within their capsid and setting them loose. Phages require modification to get past the much more complex mammalian cellular defenses. A recent study examines the possibility of combining the M13 bacteriophage with cationic liquids and polymers to form the gene delivery vector. This field is still in its infancy, but it promised us to bring incredible advances in our ability to treat diseases such as cancer. The current focus is to combine the beneficial properties of the prokaryotic focus bacteriophage in tandem with other elements from other eukaryotic targeting viruses to form the ideal vector. More generally, phages are already being used to treat a wide variety of bacterial infections simply due to their ability to destroy a targeted cell during their lytic cycle. Because phages by nature are incredibly specific, they are much less destructive to the human body than treatments like antibiotics, which kill everything in their path. The ability to deliver a treatment only to the specific source of the disease is something out of medical science fiction, and yet we are looking to one of the world's oldest organisms to solve that very problem. When looking at something like a bacteriophage, it strikes you just how diverse and downright strange our biosphere is. How can a creature with a population larger than every other organism on Earth be so unknown to us? The impacts that bacteriophages have on their environments through lysogenesis and bacterial population control are only just being researched. In just a few years, the information in this video may be wholly out of date as new and incredible features of the phage are discovered. We are living in a time where the tools we have to examine our world give us unprecedented insight into areas of life we never thought possible, but the flip side of that coin is they also reveal just how staggeringly much we don't know.